I got a phone call and this very soothing, calm voice came on and said, Hello, this is Bob Heilbronner, and you've asked me to write a blurb for your book. And this is something I cannot do, because your book is on money, and money is the scariest topic there is, and your book is going to scare the hell out of everyone. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, and I'm Patricia Pino. And today we're really honored to welcome back to the show primary MMT academic, Professor L. Randall Ray. Hi, Randy. Hi. Good to be back. For anybody wondering about where the modern money in modern money theory comes from, it comes from your seminal book, Understanding Modern Money, which turns 25 years old this year. So congratulations on that and its continuing impact. And in your latest book, Money for Beginners, an Illustrated Guide, which is beautifully illustrated by Heske van Duinen, by the way, at the beginning, you write that when you wrote Understanding Modern Money, you were warned that it would, quote, scare the heck out of everybody. (laughs) Tell us about that warning. Who did it come from? What did they mean? Yeah, so the background is that Warren Mosler had come on this discussion group online in January of '96. And not long after that, I started writing the book, Understanding Modern Money, that came out in 98. So probably in 1997, when I had much of the draft manuscript done, I sent that to Robert Heilbronner, who is maybe either the top or number two to John Kenneth Galbraith in terms of the number of books that he wrote and sold on economics. So just a towering figure. And I had met him once, but obviously he didn't know who I was. So I mailed it to him. And just strangely enough, I got a phone call back in the days when the phone hung on the wall. And this very soothing, calm voice came on and said, hello, this is Bob Heilbronner. And I was just amazed at how on earth did he get my phone number? And he said, And you've asked me to write a blurb for your book. And this is something I cannot do because your book is on money. And money is the scariest topic there is. And your book is going to scare the hell out of everyone. (laughs) Of course, that was disappointing, but it turned out he was right. And it is a scary topic. And the book did scare people. And after many years, I realized that MMT's main problem really has been that it is seen as very scary, very dangerous, and really too immoral in the sense that the main conclusion we reach is that the government cannot run out of money. And it seems like what we're saying is the government is getting something for nothing. It doesn't need income before it spends. And if that's true, That's immoral. And I think really the hostility to MMT is a moral opposition to it. It Really, it goes even beyond scaring because once they understand it, they just believe that it's immoral for the government to do that. 
I thought you were going to say that the immorality of it came sort of because MMT highlights some coercive aspects of money on behalf of the government with workers and employment. Is that not something that bothers people as much? Some of the critics have used that. So they say, oh, well, you, this sounds like fascism to me. That You mean the government imposes liabilities on people? We say, yeah, in democracies, we elect representatives and they decide what taxes to impose. And it's so funny to me that, you mean, no one has ever thought about this before? Well, taxes are obligations that we must pay. And if we don't pay them, bad things can happen to us. No one realizes that. It's the strangest critique that we get, I think, that, hold it, imposing taxes, it must be a fascist policy. <laughs> Very bizarre. But also they shoot the messenger, right? Well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, how could we be the messenger for this? <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's been this way for 4,000 years at least, right? <laughs> Hence the joke about it being modern. <laughs> but I think I'm right in saying that your preferred term is modern money theory rather than modern monetary theory, which I like to. Why is that? Because another kind of critique we get all the time is, oh, you guys are just Milton Friedman, Right. So it's just a monetary theory. You have a different monetary theory than Friedman. And then they'll say, and the bizarre thing is, you guys aren't talking about monetary policy. You're always talking about fiscal policy. Why on earth are you talking about fiscal policy when your theory is about monetary policy? Okay. And so I think it's very confusing to people. I don't know exactly how it got changed. It seems to be mostly change in Britain. There is much more pushback about trying to drop the monetary in Britain, I think. So I, I don't know exactly how that came about. I think possibly in the very beginning, we used both money and monetary. And I started seeing more and more of this kind of criticism that, hold it, you guys are all about fiscal policy. So why are you emphasizing monetary policy? And I decided that it just makes more sense to use modern money theory. And as you said, my first book was called Understanding Modern Money, and it was to explain how money works. And I did not come up with modern money theory. I think it was a commentator on Billy Blog that came up with that. And I really don't know what that commentator said, whether it was money or monetary. So let's get into your recent book, Money for Beginners, because it's timely because in the UK, at least, we've got quite a few beginners in the money field. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're in quite influential positions. <laughs> for instance, in our nominal opposition party, the Labour Party, the Shadow Culture Secretary Lucy Powell said, I think yesterday, that an incoming Labour government wouldn't be able to scrap one of the austerity policies instituted by the Conservatives, which would lift a quarter of a million children out of poverty and a further 850,000 out of deep poverty, because in her words, there is no money left. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? <laughs> and then she went on to say, that's the economic reality. Randy, is that economic reality? Well, of course not. And it's very hard to believe now that there are any politicians who actually believe such nonsense because of what we did during the COVID pandemic. The U.S. somehow found $5 trillion uh, looking under the couch pillows, I guess. And I think that everyone realizes that is a lie. So why are they using that lie? I think part of the explanation is this inflationary period that we're going through, that many people have convinced themselves that this inflation was due to too much government spending. And so they are really lying about the finances as a justification for rolling back government spending because they think that caused inflation. I was planning to say, actually, maybe she meant there is no money for the left. Or if you want to use it for conservative policies, we're fine with that. But I just noticed that Warren Mosler made the same joke on Twitter. So Absolutely. that It's important to point that out. It's easy to find the money 
for the military, for war, for what's called national defense, and for tax cuts for the rich. You can always find the money for that. So it really is the progressive policies that are going to get cut. And this, unfortunately, it comes from the top with our Labour Party. Again, it's been a real weekend. The leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, wrote an editorial for The Guardian. And in it, he wrote, if we are to turn things around, then economic stability must come first. That will mean making tough choices, having ironclad fiscal rules. The supposed alternative, huge unfunded spending increases at a time when the Tories have left nothing in the coffers is a recipe for more chaos and more misery for working people. And I think, Randy, that goes to your idea that you've said many times before that the government only spends one way. (laughs) Could you talk about that in this context of Keir Starmer's claim about the government having coffers and that they're empty now? Yeah. Well, of course, they don't have coffers and almost all spending is electronic now. Central banks make the payments for the treasury and they create it out of thin air, as the metaphor says. It's keystroke credits. They can't run out. All government spending in modern economies takes exactly the same form. Whether we will end up with a deficit at the end of the year will depend much more on what the government collects in taxes. It's generally not spending that leads to a deficit at the end of the year. It is tax revenue, and that depends on economic performance. So if your economy starts growing rapidly, which doesn't look likely (laughs) in the UK or the US, I think growth is going to be slow. But if you grew rapidly, tax revenue automatically goes up because so much of the tax revenue is based on income growth and growth of asset prices then tax revenue will boom and you could end up with a smaller than projected budget deficit at the end of the year. But the reason that I'm talking about this is because there is no such thing as deficit spending. There is no special way to finance a spending in excess of taxes. All the spending, no matter whether you end up with a deficit, a surplus, or a balanced budget at the end of the year, all the spending always takes the same form. It always looks exactly the same. You do the accounting at the end of the year and find out what the budgetary outcome was. So there's no special form of spending that we can call deficit spending. And it's really unbelievable to me to hear US politicians speak about the budget in this way, although I'm sure there's still some of them that do. But it certainly seems that MMT has made more inroads in the US than in the UK. And we were talking about narratives earlier and framing and how people perceive MMT. But one of these fiscal rules that have become quite popular, both for Tories and for Labour in the UK, I beat myself because I feel bad that that idea for a fiscal rule seems to have come from the left of Labour during the Corbyn years and when he has his advisors. And I hate to think that it was the left that gave the right this idea of weaponizing fiscal rules against government spending. Are you familiar with the argument? And do you agree with the proposition that was a bad strategy to go about? Of course it was bad. But look, the Democrats did the same in the United States. The pay-for rules that we have were put in place by the Democrats. So I'm not surprised at all to hear that the left wing did it. The Democrats are the ones who insist on pay-fors for their policies. The Republicans are the ones who are always willing to give tax cuts to the rich with no pay-fors. So they don't believe in the pay-for, and so they will always have some kind of an exception for their policies And then the Democrats insist on no exception for their own policies. It's crazy. Yeah. They turn it around against the left always. It's just so frustrating. It's that idea only Nixon could go to China, but in reverse. We need Democrats in there to give us all, to give us these fiscal straitjackets. Yeah. Well, not to go too far back in history, only Bill Clinton could end welfare. So the Democrats step up to do the things that conservatives might not be able to get away with. So we've established having funding or not having funding again. 
just isn't economic reality when you issue the currency. And also this idea that the government has coffers that fill up goes to your example in your latest book of what happens to government tax revenue after it's collected. And you use some very old historical examples like the Virginia colonists. Could you talk about that? Sure. We can go a bit further back. So medieval Europe, the crown used tally sticks. And in English, we have these terms, raise a tally. And this was the main instrument used by the crowns in Europe to spend. So everyone thinks that they spent coins, but coins were always a very small proportion of the money supply. Kings mostly spent tally sticks. So they would raise a tally. That would be tell the exchequer to go out and cut hazelwood sticks. And then you score them. That is, you put a score, using the term of cutting wood, a score across the tally stick. And then you split it in two so that you have a stock and a stub. And the king would purchase a wagon with half of a tally stick. At the same time that they would raise a tally, they would impose a tax payable in the tally sticks. And so the exchequer would collect those halves of the tally sticks that had been spent and match them to make sure there had been no counterfeiting. The counterfeit would be adding some additional scores on the stick to make them more valuable. So check to make sure there's no counterfeiting. And once matched, they would always burn them. So in the American colonies, they came up with a new innovation, which was paper money, new to the West, although China had done it for several hundred years before. The American colonies, of course, used the British coins, but they were always short and they were prohibited from coining their own money. They found a loophole. <laughs> there was no prohibition on issuing paper bills. So the state government would enact a law that allowed the issue of, let's say, 10,000 Virginia pounds. All 13 colonies did this. So there was some form of paper money in every one of them. But just take Virginia as the example. They could issue 10,000 pounds. And at the same time, they would pass a new tax law called a redemption tax. So this makes it clear they knew what they were doing that would be expected to raise about 10,000 pounds over the next two or three years, that the tax would be in place. And so people could pay that tax with the paper money, and that gave them an incentive to accept the paper money. So the legislature would spend the currency into existence, buying what the government needed, and then collect the paper money in tax payment. They kept very careful records. The expert on this is Farley Grubb, who has looked at several of the colonies. They kept very careful records of the tax receipts and how much of the tax was paid with the paper money versus how much was paid with the British coins. Typically, about 75% of the tax would be paid with the paper money. And then they would record that they burned it. So as soon as they received the tax revenue, they burned it. So what do we learn from that? Tax revenue is not to get something that you can spend, it's to get something that you can burn. Revenue is for burning, not for spending. And of course, it had to work that way because nobody could have paid the tax in the paper money unless you had spent the paper money into existence. So spending comes first, that's how the money gets into the economy. And then taxing redeems the currency, taking it out and burning it, just like the tally sticks had been burned. I bring that up because I think there's something that people miss when we talk about today tax money being destroyed or deleted when it's returned to the issuer. I think some people might think we're saying in the old days, governments used to burn or melt down their tax revenue after they collected it. And these days, if you pay them in cash, they'll shred it after they've collected it. And that's our proof that money's deleted from existence when you pay taxes. But I would say what we're actually saying is the thing that money is, which is a promise to do something, 
And in the case of a pound, that's a promise to pay off a pound's worth of any charge that the government might levy on you, the most common charge being taxes. But once it's in the hands of the issuer, the government, it ceases to be that promise. It just becomes paper or metal or in terms of electronic ledger entries, they've become just literally nothing. And I think you help underline that when you write about the reason that governments publicly burned their tax revenue in days gone by was to stop those pieces of paper being used again or for unscrupulous government representatives stealing them away and using them again. So it was proof that they've been taken out of circulation. But to me, those pieces of paper stopped being money the moment they were returned to the issuer. Does that sound about right? Sure, that's exactly right. And so in the Illustrated Guide, we talk about Joe's Pizzeria that issues pizza coupons, mails them out to all the people in the neighborhood in order to drum up business. That pizza coupon is Joe Pizzeria's IOU. Now, it's a pizza IOU, not a money IOU, but the principle is the same. When a customer brings that coupon in, that is Joe's IOU. Joe owes them a pizza. When he delivers the pizza to them, so he puts it in the box and hands it to them, he is no longer in debt. Now, he's got his own IOU back. And so we say it'd be kind of schizoid for Joe to treat that any longer as an IOU because he owes himself a pizza, which makes no sense, right? So what does he do with the IOU? He burns it because it's no longer valuable once it's in his hands. Then we go next to the example of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States Our paper money is all issued by the Fed now. Our treasury doesn't issue any paper money anymore. So all of the paper money in the United States is the Fed's IOU. When it goes back to the Fed, the Fed can just shred it because once it is at the Fed, it has no value except as paper. And so they do shred it. And if you take a tour of the Fed, they'll give you a little baggie with shredded paper money. I think that reinforces the point that once you receive back your own IOU, it no longer has any money value. Yeah, I bring that up because in all this sort of fiscal responsibility talk, you get some people talking about a government running a surplus like it's a good thing, like the government is saving up its own money for a rainy day, when I think what we've just said should underline that that's actually an impossibility. And let me just add, some people might say, that when the payments clear from a taxpayer to the treasury, that the electronic digits from their bank's reserve account are being in some ways collected and transferred to a treasury reserve account. So can we not think of those digits continuing to exist as money? And then when the government spends from the treasury's account, can we not think of that as taxes having been collected and then re-spent? I know some people think along those lines. Could you address that from an MMT perspective? So technically, it's not correct (laughs) because you as a taxpayer, I don't know if anyone in the UK actually pays their taxes by carrying paper money and coins to the tax office. In the United States, you could do that, but very nearly zero people do it that way. (laughs) Everyone writes a check on their bank account or they have an automatic withdrawal. And what you have is the bank's IOU. So you pay your taxes using a bank's IOU. The bank pays your taxes for you and debits your account. The treasury has not received anything that they can spend. They cannot spend any private bank's demand deposit. They can only have the central bank make their payments for them. So it's technically not correct to say the treasury has received something that they can spend because they don't have a deposit account at your bank or at any private bank on which they can make payments. They're not receiving anything that they can spend. But if the, let's say, I know that there's a consolidated fund in the UK exchequer, but there'll be an equivalent account at the treasury I guess, or within the Fed on behalf of the government that a balance goes up when the taxpayer's bank's reserve account goes down. Is that correct? Well, the Treasury does have a deposit account at the Fed. And 
The Fed, though, is going to make payments on the Treasury's behalf to private bank reserves. So that is how Treasury spends. Central bank makes a payment of reserves to a private bank. That private bank will then credit the demand deposit account of the recipient of the Treasury spending, whatever it is. Maybe it's Social Security. So what we have to do is have the central bank make the payment for the Treasury. Now, central banks often have a requirement that the Treasury have a positive balance in its account at the central bank. Now, is there any technical reason why this is necessary? Obviously, no. The central bank can always make that payment whether the treasury's account is positive, zero, or negative, okay? It's only an internal rule, it's an operating procedure that says that the treasury must have a positive balance. A negative balance does not provide a barrier that the central bank can't overcome, okay? So it's an internal accounting procedure. Now, in the case of the United States, the Fed has an operating manual for the people at the Fed, and there's a Q&A section at the end and says, what do we do if the Treasury's balance is already zero and we receive a check drawn on the Treasury? It says, enter a negative value, okay? <laughs> Which is obvious. That's what you do. What's that called? It's called an overdraft. It's like an unlimited overdraft, right? Well, it's unlimited, okay, but it's going to trigger activities by the Treasury and the central bank to fill up the Treasury's account, okay? And they have a wide variety of operations that they can use to get a positive balance. So that's what will actually happen. So it's not going to go to some unlimited number. They're going to temporarily have a negative balance, and then they're going to engage in operations to get a positive balance. Okay, that's what will happen. And the point is that positive balance, the way it gets in there, I mean, I'm now thinking about your metaphor about the magician. <laughs> you got to put the rabbits in. Okay, it could come from tax receipts that are coming in. The central bank handles all the tax payments too. So when you pay your taxes, the central bank debits your bank's reserves, your bank debits your deposit account, and the Fed will credit the Treasury's account, okay? So tax receipts are one way to do it. But think about this problem that the central bank and Treasury have. In the case of the United States, 350 million people, not all those are taxpayers because <laughs> there are children there too, but several hundred million taxpayers plus firms that pay taxes and tax payments are bunched up around quarterly due dates. So four times a year for business firms or for average households, it's April 15th. That's the magic day that we pay our taxes. And so the tax payments come in in huge bunches, okay, at specific times of the year. On the other hand, Government spending is much more spaced out over the course of the year. And when the government mails out a check, they don't really know when the recipient is going to deposit that. And then two or three days later, that check will need to be cleared. Okay? So the spending is pretty uniform across the year, although the first of the month is when Social Security checks used to go out. So you get a lot of checks cashed a couple days after the first, but the tax payments are really botched. And so they are not coordinated is what I'm saying. Therefore, the Fed and Treasury, and this is true in every country, the Treasury and Central Bank have to work out procedures in order to get positive balances in the Treasury's accounts. And they have a variety of procedures. I studied the US and Canada and Students who studied MMT went on to study the situations in their own country, including Brazil, for example, and China. And they've all developed procedures to allow them to get a positive balance, even when the tax revenue is not coming in. Okay. And one of the main 
methods of doing that is bond sales. So they can sell bonds in order to get positive balances. It's not that the government is borrowing. It is this technicality that requires a positive balance in the treasury's account at the central bank. So if the legislation was changed and the negative balance was simply allowed to exist indefinitely, there wouldn't even be a need to do these things or issue bonds. It would make things so much simpler <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for the Fed and the Treasury. Why did they set it up this way? In the United States, this dates to 1913 when the Fed was created. So unlike Britain, we did not have a central bank till 1913, which is pretty unbelievable that we existed for so long without one. And really, frankly, that's why the U.S. had the worst monetary history of any of the countries that became rich, developed countries, because we didn't have a central bank. The central banks were set up originally to finance government spending. That was their purpose. And then in the 19th century, it was discovered that because of their position in the financial system, they also could stop bank runs. So that became their second main function. The Fed was set up specifically to stop bank runs and not to finance the government. And so the clause was put in the Federal Reserve Act that the Fed could not allow overdrafts and could not buy government bonds at all, not even in secondary markets. That was the way the Fed was set up because they didn't want the Fed involved at all in financing government spending. And the main reason for that is they wanted to keep the federal government extremely small and poor. That all changed with World War I and World War II and the Great Depression. So we had a very small federal government in the United States until the Depression and World War II. And then the federal government became large and government finance became an important issue. But previous to that, we didn't want a big government with the financial ability to grow. So while we're talking about this history, and you touched on the history of the Clinton years a while ago, just a quote from, again, sorry, everybody, you must be sick of hearing me say his name, Keir Starmer. Just a quote from Keir Starmer's article this weekend. He writes, frankly, the left has to start caring a lot more about growth, about creating wealth, attracting inward investment and kickstarting a spirit of enterprise. It is the only show in town for those who dream of a brighter future. And this idea that Keir Starmer is leaning into at the moment, that only growth can save us, that government spending can only hinder us, that we can't solve any problem as a nation without the almighty private sector, which in fact, Stephanie Kelton recently called learned helplessness. This idea comes from a tradition of economic thought that in your book, you trace from Reagan to Thatcher to Clinton, as you say, ending welfare as we know it, to George W. Bush's ownership society. And it's this idea that once the government stops coddling people, everything just gets better all on its own. Could you talk about that history? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's so, so sad, especially that it would come from a party that's supposed to be more left. Yeah. It's just, if you start unpacking it, every single piece of that is wrong. Just empirically wrong, theoretically incoherent. It's just not true. In the United States, I know much more about the United States, but it also serves as a useful example, I think. So we had this small government capitalism that collapsed into the Great Depression. And that was when we switched gears. We discovered, as Keynes had written in the end of laissez-faire, before the Depression hit the United States, the UK was already in depression. He said that this story of laissez-faire, it's just not true. And he said, and no economist really believes it. This is a political agenda. It's not true. So anyway, in the United States, we recognized it was not true. And FDR, Roosevelt, set off on a new path where the government would play an important role in the economy. And he passed the New Deal legislation, which included jobs programs that developed the United States. The United States was an undeveloped country in 1930. Now, we had manufacturing. We had parts of our economy that were in the forefront as good as anywhere else. 
But the majority of the United States was an undeveloped country. No electricity, no running water in large parts of the United States. And what the New Deal did was to modernize our economy. So this story, government can't do that sort of stuff, is just false. It was the New Deal that prepared the United States for the role it would play in World War II. That is how we became the powerful nation that we became in World War II. The New Deal had modernized us. But second, if you look at the empirical evidence for the relation of government spending and the government role in the economy to economic growth, what you see is that when the government's share of GDP is growing, so the government is growing faster than the economy, the economic growth rate is high. When the government is shrinking relative to the size of the economy, the economic growth rate is falling. And this holds up for the past more than 100 years in the United States. When the government is growing fast, then the economy grows fast. So the idea that government leads to slower growth just is not true. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener. And we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. You also write in the book about the consequences of the massive deregulation that took place under Clinton, which we touched on. Could you talk about those consequences? Well, Clinton's deregulation continued what Reagan had been doing. So uh, our first really serious financial crisis in the post-New Deal era. So the New Deal put very tight financial regulations on. Now, gradually over time, financial institutions innovated. They were finding ways to get around some of those regulations And so the system was becoming riskier anyway. But when Reagan came in, they really deregulated what we call our savings and loans or the thrift sector. And that sector went on to do crazy and illegal things. And it collapsed in the 1980s. Half of them failed. And we had to have a rescue of the savings and loan institutions. So we had already had a lot of deregulation. When Clinton came in, He started deregulating the more dangerous part of the financial system. Thrifts were relatively small. Probably the total bailout of the thrift sector was under $200 billion. So a billion is a lot, but $200 billion that time around. The deregulation of Clinton was much more dangerous because we are deregulating the biggest, most dangerous institutions, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, and so on. And the bailout of that, as we've shown in work at the Leib Institute, was $29 trillion. <laughs> So the bailout was much, much bigger. The hole that we were in was much deeper. The crisis was much deeper. And of course, it became a global financial crisis that time around. It wasn't limited to the United States. So the crisis spread around the world. It took 10 years for our economy to recover from that. So 
Clinton's deregulation was much more important in terms of freeing the biggest institutions to engage in dangerous and fraudulent activity. And we have never re-regulated them. So the potential for another crisis like the global financial crisis is with us all the time. Except now we have Mosler's Law. <laughs> there is no financial crisis so deep that a large enough fiscal adjustment can't solve it. You know, and they're falling back on that a lot these days, right? I'm not on board with that. Okay. I may have misstated it. No, I think that is Warren's position. I don't think that a fiscal response to the global financial crisis would have been sufficient. The $29 trillion that I was talking about was the Fed, not the fiscal response. Our fiscal response, and on this I will agree with Warren, our fiscal response was minuscule and it was stupid to have such a small fiscal response. We needed a much bigger fiscal response. That's why it took 10 years for the economy to recover the number of jobs we had lost and so on. So the law still holds that if the fiscal response was big enough, it would have been solved better. It would have helped resolve the problems with the real part of the economy, but the financial sector would not have recovered. I, it, it's hard to know what things would have been like if the Fed had not done that. 40% of that bailout of that $29 trillion was outside the United States. So the problems in Europe would have been much worse than they were, and a few other parts of the world would have been much worse without the Fed's response. And who knows where the dollar as international reserve currency might be today without the Fed protecting a global financial system based on the dollar. So the only part that I'm disagreeing with, Warren, is I think we had to have a financial response too. Now, I don't like the fact that we bailed out the financial sector and asked nothing in return. We just patted them on their little bottoms and told them, go back doing what you were doing before. Okay, so that was a huge mistake. But did we need to have a huge financial response? I think we did. To be fair to Warren, I think even now when seeing the crisis in Silicon Valley banks, he does talk about the need for the central bank to guarantee deposits and intervene that way to ensure financial instability. I'm sure he'll agree with what Randy's saying. As you were saying that, Randy, I was thinking, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but I was thinking the debt write-offs, the bailouts of what happens with fiscal deficits when speculative bubbles burst could be thought of as fiscal stimulus just done really badly and never targeted where it's needed. I think a lot of credit that was created through the SNL scams, that all got written off. The debt side of that got written off. So in a way, that's stimulating the economy. Or maybe I'm completely off base with that. Well, actually, I think that we needed much more debt write-off right, right. for households. Right now, there's a big debate about the student loan debts. I, those should be written off, and that would help the economy a lot. Another Levy report that has gotten a lot of press ran simulations to see what the impact on the economy would be, and it's very favorable to forgive student debts. It seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah. I think Britain has a better approach to student debt than we do. Yeah, well, it hasn't quite got to the epidemic scale that I think it's gotten in the States as well. So we're resembling the US system more and more <laughs> every day. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. And obviously, and to go along with all these complaints that we're making about the opposition at the moment, another thing that they backtracked on was that they were going to scrap tuition fees, I think. Then they backtracked on that. Oh, I, I mean, Labour is backtracked on absolutely everything. So yeah, yeah, no one surprised me. Well, you know what the coming thing is. You're watching France. The coming thing is going to be Social Security for the aged. They can't, though, on that one, because at least not if it's a Tory government, because that's their core voting. Every time they've tried to mess with pensions and what they call the, is it their rule? They have like a rule around it. I can't remember. Oh, the triple lock. Yeah, the triple lock on pensions. Yeah, so that's like this three, I don't know if you've heard of this, Randy, but there's three indicators that they follow. One is median wages and the other one is inflation. And there's a third one, I can't remember what it is, but the triple lock means that 
pensions will always be increased by whichever is the highest of these three indicators, basically. And I mean, pensions in the UK, I think, is the lowest in Europe, at the very least. So it's not generous by a long shot, but at least a Tory party, they'd find it difficult to go against their core voters. If Labour does it, that's different, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's why it will be Labour there and it will be Democrats here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it? Conservatives fear their base and centre leftists are absolutely contemptuous of their base, basically. <laughs> and uh, like you say in, in your book, Randy, every one of these blow ups, we've been talking about uh, crises, SNL crises and the great financial crisis. Every one of these blow ups works out absolutely fine <laughs> for the very top of the income distribution. How does that work? It's like magic. So back in the Kennedy years, so early 60s, the Keynesian economists became the chief advisors to the president. And they had this theory that a rising tide raises all boats. And so if the economy is growing, that must raise the boats of the people at the bottom. What it turns out to be true is that the rising tide raises the yachts. So Pavlina Cherneva, my colleague at BART, has a graph that became famous where she showed every single recovery since World War II increased the share of the people at the top. So the way I put it is it's the cream always rises to the top. And it was very naive, but you know, in sort of a, a nice way, I guess, that economists and especially the economists that are supposed to be more to the left, the Keynesians, were so naive as to believe that the rising tide would benefit the people at the bottom. And the reason is because they don't take any account of power relationship. So whether the economy is performing well or performing poorly, the people at the top are going to be the ones that benefit. And that is what the data shows. So getting back to real ancient history now, Randy, in terms of interest rates, I think in the book you talk about ancient Babylonians understanding compound interest. Is that right? Is there more to tell there? So Michael Hudson is the one who has written about this and told me about it, that they knew how to do compound interest and they even had textbooks on how to calculate compound interest. And he makes the point that the interest rates were so high and because they're compounded, the debts would grow relative to ability to pay. And that is why all societies that had money and interest until Rome always had the year of Jubilee, the year of debt cancellation, because the debts become unpayable just because of the mathematics involved. Economic growth until capitalism fairly recently always was way below the interest rate. And so by simple math, the debts must grow faster than the ability to pay, which is based on the real economic growth rate. So debt had to be canceled. And this wasn't because they were all do-gooder, very liberal people. It was because the creditors got more and more power to the point that they could challenge the emperor. And so it was a way to restore the rightful, in quotes, the rightful order, which is the emperor should be the most powerful. And so debt cancellation was a way to rebalance society because otherwise the creditors get all the power. With Rome, we get property rights, and you can't just take away that property right to collect interest from your debtors. And so now, even though the economic growth rate is higher, the ability to pay generally does not grow as fast as the debts. So we see in the United States, our college graduates have debt growing faster than their ability to service the debt. And that's why the debt continues to grow until they default. And paraphrasing your old professor, Hyman Minsky, you write that anyone can create money, but neither the banks nor our government can run out. And so 
if prices are driven by scarcity and interest is the price of money in a modern money system, how is there an interest rate? Well, so the interest rate, the base of that is set by central banks. And the overnight rate is the lowest rate in the economy. That's completely under the discretion of the central bank. For a number of years after the global financial crisis, central banks kept it at zero and even tried to get it negative in some cases. That allowed all the interest rates to come down. When inflation started to rise, and that's a whole nother topic, but I don't believe that it had much, if anything, to do with government response to COVID. It was almost entirely on the supply side because of supply chain disruptions and so on, plus profit-taking by firms with market power. But the central banks responded to it as if it were driven by the demand side. So they start raising interest rates, and the theory is that would reduce people's borrowing and spending, and that would reduce inflation. But as a result, all interest rates rise. And most countries have to follow the path that is set by the biggest nations, especially the United States. So if the Fed raises interest rates, almost all countries in the world are going to have to raise theirs because they fear that financial markets will run out of their currency. So if their interest rate doesn't go up, they can't compete with the US dollar denominated assets. So everybody has to start raising rates. So that's why rates have gone up. And as they go up, the debt burden on debtors rises and we start to see people defaulting on their debts, getting behind in payments, which is what is happening now. It also triggered some of these phenomenal bank failures like Silicon Valley because they're holding assets. They were earning about 3%, which is okay when the base rate was zero, but now the base rate is above five. And so they're losing money on all their assets and they want to try to sell those assets because they're low earning, but they have to take a big haircut. That is a loss on the sale. And that's what caused bank failures. So those are the two consequences of the central bank deciding to raise rates. Now, that base rate will always be the lowest because it's very short term and it's risk free. So on top of that, you as a borrower will have to pay a premium because you are not risk free. Only the sovereign government is risk free. And depending on the term of the loan, you may also have to pay a premium for a longer term loan. So that explains why there is an interest rate on your borrowing. Well, Andrew Bailey a while back said that he argued for wage constraint on workers as a means to address inflation. And this really ties into those interest rates because basically what's happened is he's put up the price of money 13 times in a row and then said to everybody, stop putting your prices up. You know what I mean? Like, that's for me, not for thee. You know? But it's even worse because in the last year has come out that the Bank of England has actually paid out £25 million in, just in bonuses. And at the same time, he's arguing for restraint of workers. So to what extent do you agree with Andrew Bailey that workers need restraint in order to control inflation? Or is he missing something here? No, I think the evidence is very strong that what has driven inflation is coming from the supply side, plus increasing markups by firms that have the market power to raise price. And there's just so much evidence for this. The CEOs at the board meetings are proudly saying, yeah, we're taking advantage of COVID to raise prices because consumers don't punish us for it because they realize that we face these challenges. And so if they can get away with it, they're raising price. Some people said, well, hold it. If they had market power, why didn't they raise prices before COVID hit? And the answer is that they do worry about consumers say, oh, Coca-Cola raised their price. I'm going to shop for something else. They always worry about that. But when they're in an environment where the consumers aren't going to punish them and where the competition 
is also going to raise their markups, they will take advantage of that. So that is what they've been doing. And we know that over the course of COVID, what happened is markups rose, profits rose to record levels during COVID, and CEO compensation rose, and the concentration of wealth at the top rose. All of those things are occurring during COVID and during this rise of the inflation rate. The evidence is pretty clear. It is not workers that are driving this. Workers always play catch up to inflation. And so it's not surprising that we see wage demands rising because there's been inflation, but they're not the drivers of inflation. They are demanding a wage increase because their real take-home pay and their burden of their debts has gone up. So when you say workers play catch-up, is the dynamics sort of go a little bit like this? Some event or something changes in the economy that shifts the balance of power in favor of capital. Capital takes advantage of that to increase their profit margins and get more of their share of output. And workers can only hope to respond and try to defend their shares of output against this. Is that usually how the dynamic works? Yeah, both the sort of the empirical evidence, the wage increases follow inflation, but also the way the wage bargaining works. Now, I don't know much about Britain, but in the United States, our labor unions are very weak. I think we're at about 6% now of the private labor forces unionized. So most workers are not in labor unions, but labor union bargaining has always been based on what the price increases have been, not based on what we think price increases might be in the future, because that's a very weak bargaining position. So you take the strong one, which is, hold it, last year prices rose by this amount. We need our wages to rise to take account of how much prices have risen. It's a stronger bargaining point, and that's the one that labor unions use. And we shouldn't miss an opportunity to say that the Institute for Public Policy Research recently did a study that said raising pay by 10% on average for public sector workers wouldn't add significantly to inflation, like next to nothing as well. So that whole thing that our government has been touting at the moment, the reason why they didn't raise or they were reticent to give public sector pay workers a raise. And just recently, their final offer is 6%. But their whole rationale for holding back on that was that it would en- entrench inflation and turns out not to be the case. Yeah. And uh, I think that is also true in the private sector, that, of course, labor costs are important, but increasing wages by 6% or whatever is not going to have a huge impact on total costs. And furthermore, we know the markups over labor costs have gone up. So all we're doing is giving back to labor some of the share that they've lost because of inflation over the past little bit more than a year. I mean, we always focus on the conflict between capital and workers, and that's certainly the main conflict going on here. But it is true as well that in this particular situation where it was triggered by energy shortages and then capital took advantage of that, it was a particular sector (laughs) <laughs> that took advantage of that. And it could be to the detriment of other parts of industry. Does that conflict p- play a role at all? Is there a way to sort of turn certain sections of capital against each other in order to prevent this from happening? Well, of course, there's conflicts within the corporate sector itself. And there are conflicts between your domestic firms and, say, global energy suppliers, OPEC especially, where OPEC is trying to increase its share of global profits. The financial sector in the United States gets 40% of all corporate profit, and the financial sector is always trying to increase its share. So there are conflicts within the corporate sector too. And there's also this conflict with your central bank because interest is a huge business cost. And the most bizarre thing is if you ask any economist, well, what happens if wages go up? Well, that's a cost, so prices are going to go up. What happens if energy prices go up? Well, that's a cost, so prices go up. What happens if interest rates go up? Well, that's a cost, 
so prices go down. <laughs> and it, it's very bizarre. So right now, your central bank and our central bank are inflationary. They are raising interest rates, which is a cost of doing business. So they're adding to inflation pressures on the supply side of the economy. Why aren't people worried about that one? For lots of kinds of firms, interest and rent are probably bigger costs than labor costs. Why is no one talking about that? Because in the United States, rents have been exploding over the past couple of years for a couple of different reasons. We haven't had enough construction since the global financial crisis, so we have a housing shortage across the United States. And then also there has been a concentration of ownership of rental units in the hands of mainly financial sector firms. They're trying to monopolize rent, so they're raising rents. And then partly because we had a moratorium on rent increases. And when once that went off, landlords are raising rents. So all of these things are inflationary. I don't know the data in the UK, but in the United States, I think the latest figure is something like 70% of the measured inflation in the United States is now shelter, which has nothing to do with wages and it doesn't have anything to do with energy. It's shelter. And the raising the interest rates is not going to help that. It will just reduce housing construction. So, yeah, what I wanted to ask you is, obviously, we're talking about it now. You touch on it in the book. We've got an affordable housing crisis in the US. We've definitely got one here in the UK. So, sorry if this is a too big question, but uh, through an MMT lens, if you were in charge, how would you go about tackling that crisis in an MMT-informed way? Yes. Well, the United Nations Human Rights Charter says people have a right to a place to live. And they also have a right to a job and then many other rights. So let's focus on that right. In, in the United States, we have an explosion of homelessness. I live near Portland, Oregon right now, and they have made it illegal to camp on the sidewalks or out in the open. But there is no housing for the people. And many of these have jobs. But there's no housing for them. Okay. In order to satisfy that recognized human right, we need massive investments in low income. And it has to either be public or publicly subsidized housing. Rather than raising interest rates and trying to shut down housing construction, we need massive investments in housing construction. And the government has to play a big role in doing this. The government cannot run out of money. The government can afford this. The only question is, can we find the resources we need to construct the housing? And the answer to those questions is that some of the resources are in short supply. We're going to need investments in apprenticeships and so on. We're going to need investments in new methods of building sustainable housing, sustainable in the environmental sense to make them more energy efficient and so on. We're going to probably need to change the way that we build housing so that it's more factory-based rather than on-site construction, more efficient building of the housing. But the government has to play a big role in doing this. And the government can always afford it. We know that. Uh, my quandary is, do you see it as I see it as, well, obviously there's not enough housing. That's the problem right now. And that's why people who can afford to be housed can barely afford it. And then there's lots of homelessness as well. I think some people think that there's something we could do with taxes or something <laughs> that's going to change the equation, but I don't see it. For instance, land value tax. I'm talking with some very engaged and generous people who are into land value tax at the moment and sporadically, but I'm not convinced. Any thoughts? Well, I've always advocated a cubic foot of housing space tax. Space value tax, right. Instead of a land tax, because we can use that to promote smaller houses that are more energy efficient than huge monstrosities that are being built in U.S. suburbs that sort of maximize the amount of energy that is needed. And in the United States, California, and I think Oregon, at least parts of Oregon, 
have allowed the construction of these housing units in backyards, small housing units. I think California has made it illegal to mandate single family homes. So typically in suburbs, the localities would mandate only single family homes could be built. I think that's now illegal in California. So that helps to promote more housing. There is a very big problem in getting construction projects approved because of the fears of having multifamily housing, which allows lower income people to live in your communities in the United States. So the NIMBY thing, not in my backyard. I don't want any low income housing. We have to change attitudes. We have to change laws about all that stuff. I think those things are more important than trying to use taxes as a way to drive it, just as I think that there are better ways to stop pollution than putting a tax on it. That's sort of a market-based approach, and I think that often market-based approaches are not as good as good regulatory positions. I think in the UK, we have the opposite problem for a while. In London, landlords were making houses where rooms were so small that the government had to legislate to put minimum size of rooms because here houses and rents are priced by number of rooms as opposed to I think in the US is by meter squared. Well, we don't use meters. Oh, well, square feet. (laughs) Well, depending where you are, acres. (laughs) We've had very strange laws. We've had taxes based on number of windows. Therefore, you board up all the windows. We had taxes based on number of rooms where they counted closets as rooms. So if you go to old Victorians, there won't be any closets because those would count as rooms. Well, to be fair, closets are pretty big in the state. (laughs) But anyway, yes, the rules and laws can also be poorly designed (laughs) and you end up with results you don't want. Yeah. So they should be thought about very carefully. Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I know Patricia and I could talk for hours, but I think we'd all get in trouble with our families. Before we wrap up, Randy, let's talk about what you've got coming up. Are you working on any papers at the moment or thinking about them soon as it's the holidays? Well, I've just finished several MMT related ones. I have a project on value theory that I'm working on. I finished a draft a year ago and I tried to pull it out this summer to try to work on it some more. David Graeber has a great book on value theory. Now, he's very well known for the crappy jobs and very well known for the 5,000 years of debt, but his value theory book is really good. I highly recommend it. And I've been influenced by his work and by the work of David Levine and of Duncan Foley. So anyway, that's what I'm working on. A project on value theory It started off in MMT, we say taxes drive money, but taxes don't determine the value of money. If we have a job guarantee, then the wage in that program sort of regulates the value of money. You have to work an hour in order to earn 15 bucks in the job guarantee program. So that gives us a value theory and you see it is related to labor. And Marxians and his followers have a labor theory of value. Keynes, I think it can be argued, also had a labor theory of value. And I'm trying to see if we can synthesize these various approaches that give significance to the wage in determining the value of money. So that's the project I'm working on. So at the conference in Berlin, I think you're speaking on MMT and the euro. And I believe Dirk Entz, our friend, his recent contributions have changed the picture a little bit for MMT and the euro. Yes. He and I are co-authors on an article. I think he's probably going to present that. I think he has presented it somewhere. It's not quite done, but pretty close to being submitted to a journal. So yeah, Dirk... I think has changed the way that we're looking at the euro. He believes the, what we say, the technical problems have all been resolved. The bias toward austerity has not been resolved. So what we're left with is the the euro area is in more of the situation that's similar to the UK and the United States, where it's the willingness to spend that's the problem, not the setup of the euro, really. 
Okay. And I'll link to our episodes with Dirk where we talk about that. And a lot of what's changed is the fiscal rules have been turned off, haven't they? You know, at various times, but then there's always the danger that they're going to get turned back on again. The European Commission, not known for doing the right thing at all times. Austerity is still a big danger. And so to circle back to where we started, Randy, we're always looking for ways to change or even given the way that, for instance, our Labour Party has gone and they're trying to take us back to the 80s with their, I don't know, their growth is going to save us narrative. We're always looking for ways to change or just begin the conversation about money and its central importance to democracy. How can we talk about money in a way that moves the conversation in the right direction with or without scaring the heck out of everyone? We have to recognize the problem really is not that government can run out of money because it can't. The problem is identifying the priorities, so making good policy, and then identifying the resources that are available and mobilizing those. And this is what John Yarmouth, who was the head of the House Budget Committee, recognized and gave a very important interview on CNN where he laid that out. We can always afford it. The question is, can we find and mobilize and supervise the resources to accomplish the public objectives, to pursue the public purpose? That's the real question. You've got to get policymakers who really want to pursue the public interest. That's the big challenge for democracy. We're definitely not there and neither are you. I'm on that bombshell. <laughs> Great stuff, Randy. And thanks for not scaring the heck out of us since 1998. That's a great place to leave it. We've been talking to Professor L. Randall Ray, author of Money for Beginners, an Illustrated Guide, which Professor James Galbraith calls brilliant. And Professor Steve Keen says that it contains more wisdom on money than all the textbooks in the world. So we'll link to where you can get hold of that book in the show notes and to where you can find out more about the third international European MMT conference, which takes place in Berlin on the 9th and 10th of September. And that will feature Professor Ray along with with MMT founder Warren Mosler. Perhaps we'll have a panel on Mosler's Law. All alongside Nathan Tankus, Stephen Hale, Dirk Hentz, Fidel Kaboob, Nadongo Sambasila, Yan Lang, and many more. Me and Patricia will be there. We hope you can make it. For our UK listeners, there's going to be an event in London on the 1st of September featuring Warren Mosler. Tickets aren't on sale yet, and so I'll link to where you can sign up to the GIMS mailing list for updates about that. And for our Australian listeners, there's a Rethinking Capitalism weekend coming up in Canberra in August. And finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all our patron-only episodes, including edited audio highlights of the book launch of the 2023 anthology MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers, which Professor Ray has also contributed to. So check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today on the MMT podcast, Professor L. Randall Ray. All right. Thanks. It was fun. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.